Shutter speed. It's not as simple as you might think. Right. I mean, at first you learn how to freeze motion, but there's much more to it than that. You can use it artistically. You can use it to enhance your photo. It can be a key part of storytelling. Showing or freezing motion can make or break a picture. And things like the reciprocal rule, which were invented in the film era, don't necessarily apply anymore. So we have some new rules that we hope people will use instead. First, let's tell them who brings this, who makes this possible, Chelsea. This episode is brought to you by The Great Courses Plus. The Great Courses Plus is a subscription on-demand video learning service where you can enjoy lectures from top professors all around the world. These courses stream from your TV, tablet, laptop, or phone through any web browser or available apps. You can get The Great Courses Plus for free for one month. Get a trial. You can go to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Tony and see what it's all about. I've already checked out some videos. Yeah, me too. And these people, they like learning from video. Yeah. They're they clearly do. visual learners. The great thing about The Great Courses Plus is the content is all organized, not like YouTube, which is just a random stream of stuff. It's organized and professional. If you want to check it out for free, get a trial at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Tony. Yeah. We're going to be talking about like how and when to apply shutter speed, but not which buttons to push on your camera. Yeah, if you're looking for how to actually dial it in on your camera, then you can go to sdp.io slash tutorials and search your model of camera. We have some overviews specifically for you or a model of camera similar to yours, and you can learn how to actually dial it in and use the buttons. Let's talk about all the reasons you might want to use a slow shutter speed. Right, because sometimes you do. Right, and specifically you'll use it to show action, and we have examples here. So. I, we review your photos every week on our live show, and a common thing that I see is people are so focused on freezing motion that they forget sometimes you need motion to show that there's movement. It makes a picture more interesting. So this is an example of that. In Cuba, we were showing pictures of the cars, and we wanted to show some panning to show some movement and make the background less distracting. Whenever I see a car picture, I tell people to get those wheels spinning. Otherwise, it looks like the car is just parked. If yeah. this were shot at one one thousandth of a second, you would just see a still car and you'd have no idea that it's moving. One thirtieth of a second, the background's blurred, the wheels are spinning a little bit. We'll talk about which exact shutter speed you should use and how you'll figure that out in just a second. Some things are really fast, like a hummingbird. Those wings move so fast that even at one five hundredth of a second, the wings aren't frozen. Which is okay. It's good, because right? Because it's showing some motion here. It's not just a little bird suspended in air frozen, which could be okay too, stylistically. But here it shows some movement. I think it makes it more interesting. And the whole bird is moving, but the wings are moving more than the head of the bird. So the head seems sharp while the wings seem blurry. Music. This is one of those, you know, like a concert is filled with action. Right. They don't just freeze their like and mannequins. energy. Yeah, they're yeah. not just standing there. Hopefully, that'd be a bad concert if they just kind of stood there. Um, but here, you can see that the musician, Sean, his face is frozen and sharp, but his hand is strumming, and that just adds a little bit of interest and movement and life to the picture. And that's the art of the shutter speed, is finding that one where his face is sharp, but his hand is moving just enough. And yeah. it's not always going to be the same. Slow yeah. jazz concert, you're going to have to go with like one quarter of a second because they don't move as fast. It could be crazy. You don't know. Uh, here's an example. At 1 one sixtieth, I pretty much froze the sticks of this drummer, but he was crazy and he was fun. He was moving all around and I wanted to show that. That doesn't convey at all in that so shot. So I went to 1 25th and I got those sticks moving. And you can see his face is a little bit, you know, has a little bit of motion blur. You can keep shooting until you get that perfect photo where their face is frozen and the sticks are moving, or you can leave it if you just want to show overall motion. That's the trade-off, right? You want to show motion, but sometimes you'll end up with just a blurry picture for some other reasons. Yeah. As you go slower and slower, the percentage of shots that turn out sharp begins to drop. Right. So you offset that by taking more and more pictures. Yeah. You do that, and you figure out what that perfect shutter speed is by just experimenting. You take some okay. pictures... And we'll give you some starting points and then you review them. And if there's not enough motion, guess what? You cut that shutter speed in half. You go slower and slower. If there's too much motion and you're not getting any pictures that are mostly sharp, then you might have to go up and increase your shutter speed and go even faster. Put your camera in shutter priority, auto ISO, and let the camera take care of everything except the shutter speed. I tend to start at a higher shutter speed and work down. 
Yeah, at that higher shutter speed, you'll like get, you'll guarantee you get something. Because well, this is why because I don't want the moment to be lost, and then the whole picture is blurry if it's more fleeting. So I'll start at a higher shutter speed and know that I'm at least capturing something, and then kind of get more artistic with it if I want to show some movement. But you have to decide on location. You have to take a moment and chimp with your pictures because you don't know if the drummer, if he's moving his hand really fast or a little bit slow, it's going to depend on your focal length, how close you are, what the angle of view is. Yeah. There's so much to it. Another good reason to think about your shutter speed and choose it manually rather than letting the camera choose it is because you want to smooth the movement of things like water and clouds and provide an ethereal look. Here's a waterfall at a fairly slow shutter speed, one tenth of a second, but you can see that it still captures that action. Some of the force of the water is still there for better or worse. Whether that's what you want or not is an artistic choice. Go slower at a second and a half and you can see now the water looks much feathery, feathery softer. Go even slower. This Chelsea, this is your shot at a full eight seconds and this isn't what we saw with our eyes at all. We saw lots of little water droplets pouring off the back of the whale tail, but with a long shutter speed at night, it became really soft and almost kind of magical and heavenly. Yeah. It's not realistic, but that's the story that you decided to tell a little more of a romantic story. Well, it changes the composition of a photo as well. So, a long shutter speed can be a, composition, a compositional element because it can take it from a few trickles of water to a line in a photo. Yeah, and that's something you have to, you can't see with your eye. So you have to learn to imagine it. You see these water droplets coming off that tail and know that in the final picture, it's going to be an extension of that tail. Going all the way to 30 seconds, a really long shutter speed, everything becomes super, super foggy almost because the mist flying off the water now has its own presence in the image. In this wide angle shot, the clouds themselves have moved during that course of 30 seconds. So instead of being a puffy cloud, it becomes a smooth line, mm -hmm. almost like a fog in the sky, drastically changing the image from what we actually saw, but creating a, a vision that might be a little more artistic. That's the choice of the photographer. That's the role of the photographer. That's a decision the camera can't make in automatic mode for you. Right. It's an artistic choice. And of course, those long exposures, you can't hold a camera still for 30 seconds. You need, you need a tripod. A, tripod. Yeah. a steady tripod. Another reason to use a long shutter speed is to obscure movement that from, from moving subjects that might otherwise overpower your frame, over, overpower your picture. This is Shibuya Station in Tokyo that they call the busiest intersection in the world where literally thousands of people move across the street every time the little walk sign turns green. And if all of those people were still, if they were all in focus and sharp, that would be really distracting. They would also appear to be frozen like mannequins, but at a half second, that's enough to show all these people move their movement and almost make them kind of ghostly. Yeah. And it allows you to take in the overall intersection more. Yeah, and it also tells the story of the intersection more too. People are moving through it. There's a lot of different people. You don't focus on any individual. It's more about the crowd. So you're taking a picture that would have been a big frozen crowd and you're turning it into the movement of the people and the environment and it tells the story of this location. Um, I've, I'll use this technique at a crowded monument you know, if you're at, I think we were in Washington and the monument was just covered in people, but I wanted it to be more about the monument than the people. So I'll do a long exposure and just get all of those people moving out. Yeah, because they are moving, because they become a little bit blurry, they're less interesting to the eye. So yeah. someone looking at the picture doesn't look at them, but they look at everything else. Yeah, and that's what this picture does at a two second shutter speed. You see that there are people there and you see that they're walking under the Brooklyn Bridge, but it's still very much about the Brooklyn Bridge. Now a picture like this presented a technical challenge because at two seconds, there's no way I could have set the camera to take a two second exposure in broad daylight. It would have been overexposed. So I had to put a neutral density filter on the camera to allow me to take that slow shutter speed. We do have another video that shows you kind of a free alternative you can use if you don't, if you forgot to bring your ND filter or if you don't want to buy an ND filter that can provide very similar results. Yeah. A long shutter speed can also be used for light painting. It's pretty popular, pretty trendy. Yeah, with light painting, you take some sort of light source and move it through the frame while the shutter's open. And we cover this in chapter 10 of Stunning Digital Photography. 
And this was done with a pixel stick, which is just one long row of pixels. LED lights, yeah. Yeah, and we had it configured like a rainbow. You can do other things with it, but we just moved it gradually through the frame and it made this like long kind of crazy looking ribbon over the course of 10 seconds. And with light painting, you often don't know how long you're going to be painting for. So sometimes I'll just lock the shutter open, do the painting and then release the shutter because you don't know if it's gonna, you, if it's gonna take you five seconds or 30 seconds. So you just leave it open as long as necessary and then you can adjust the brightness of it later. Oh, we did this photo with a 30 second exposure. Now, did we set off, did we turn on a flashlight to light you up every once in a while as you move through the frame? Yeah, this is me, just me, but I yeah. appear three different times in the frame because you were there with a flashlight and I was in the back and you lit me up with the flashlight and then you turned the flashlight off and I stepped forward and you lit me up again and I stepped forward and you lit me up again. But shutter speed was key here because I could not have done that in one thirtieth of a second. I couldn't move to three different spots, but 30 seconds was plenty of time for me to move to three different spots and light myself equally in all three places. It's pretty spooky. It is spooky. Cars become long trails of lights at night when you leave the shutter open for a long period of time. Headlights are white, brake lights tend to be red. And when you work along, work with long shutter speeds a lot, you eventually begin to see those cars in your mind, not as individual cars, but as long lines that you can use as compositional elements. Yeah, and I see this used, sometimes there are pictures and they want to do night photography, so they want a night shot and there's a beautiful winding road and photographers will accentuate that by waiting for a car to come and drive through the frame and accentuate the lines in the photo. So, gotta get crafty. Think of all the different ways to use that long shutter speed. Steel wool, taking it two minutes. Light up steel wool, pull it <laughs> in a whisk and just spin it in circles. We cover this in chapter 10, as well as some safety guidelines there. So you have to be careful with it, but you can see, you can create really cool effects with long shutter speeds, things that your eye could never see. The picture's interesting because you don't see this because it's impossible to take in something like this. Your camera can see it, but your eye cannot. Same with this example. I did it with a simple $2 plastic Glastic. flashlight. Yeah. Oh, it was, yeah. And just moved it around. We have a whole video that shows you how to do that. And it took me about two minutes to get it done. Makes it look like fire. If you want to learn from more videos, you can check out our sponsor, The Great Courses Plus. You can get a one month free trial at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Tony. And then they have plans starting from just $14.99 a month. I've been watching videos on The Great Courses Plus. Yeah, me too. Well, even before they were our sponsor, because I like that Neil deGrasse Tyson video. They have things about physics. A lot of science stuff, yeah. So Professor Seth Freeman, he has 24 videos about uh, the best way to negotiate a deal. Something that any photographer I think could learn because you have to often negotiate prices or negotiate contracts or even negotiate your way into a photo shoot in the first place. So I have these videos in my watch list. They have everything from negotiating creatively to even cross-cultural negotiations. So that'll be good if you're trying to negotiate some deals in another country, uh, but there's plenty on there. There's one for learning how to do chess, which I'll probably be using so I can beat you. There's a whole bunch of stuff. So if you're interested in learning about photography, which they also have courses in, uh, negotiating for your photography business, or just beating your friend in chess, you can check out The Great Courses Plus. It's at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Tony. And just try a free trial and tell me what you think. And watch that Neil deGrasse Tyson one. That was, I like that one. There's a link in the description down below if you don't feel like typing. Let's talk about motion blur, because along with choosing your shutter speed deliberately to make create an effect, you can pick up these kind of negative side effects. And motion blur is the negative side effect of using a long shutter speed. With motion blur, the subject is actually moving. And this is a, a picture taken at 30 seconds. And you can see the lighthouse there is nice and sharp, but the moon itself was moving enough that it became weird looking, all elongated. Yeah, it moves pretty quickly on the horizon, especially you see it. Yeah, I, I was getting uh, motion blur with the moon at like a quarter of a second, a sixteenth of a second, especially with a telephoto lens. It moves really very fast, not something some, people think about. You had to do some image stacking to get a clear 
shot that you wanted. Yeah. It, which we have another video on. If you go search our videos, you can see we have a video on image tacking. One thirtieth of a second was not enough to freeze the motion of this deer. You can see it's motion blur in that camera shake because the background itself is nice and sharp, but the deer is chewing something. Yeah. So its mouth is moving, but that ruined the picture. That's it wasn't a good, desirable motion. Yeah, that's a good thing to take note of because we get a lot of messages. Why is there something wrong with my camera? Is there something wrong with my lens? Uh, nothing's in focus. And sometimes it's your, it's your shutter speed and sometimes it's motion blur. So seeing these little differences, the background sharp, the foreground is moving. It's going to help you troubleshoot. Yeah, this picture looks out of focus, but it is in focus. It's just a combination of the subject having motion blur and the background having background blur. Yeah, I took this picture of an osprey. Well, first of all, he was perched, so my shutter speed was very slow because it was a dark day and uh, I wanted it to be a clean photo. But when he took off, I still had that slow shutter speed, 1 to 50th, and so it was not enough to freeze the bird, unfortunately. Could've this been, happens all the time. Could have been a cool shot. Because you want that slow shutter speed when the subject is still, yeah. when they're perched. But then as soon as they start moving, you need to be at one two thousandths of a second. Well, so when I'm shooting wildlife, I go into shutter priority because then I just have to scoot my dial there and go a little bit faster. So I wasn't quite fast enough on this one. But Sometimes you don't have time to actually pick one two thousandths of a second. I just literally just like roll my finger, and just something it higher. Yeah. Because it can happen in an instant. And it's not just wildlife, with me. <laughs> but sports too. If you're taking a picture of a batter at first base, you probably want to get a little of the motion of the bat in there. Yeah. Uh, but then as soon as they start running to first base, you want to be able to freeze the action of them running because you need a faster shutter speed to freeze to freeze them while they're running than you do when they're just standing still and batting. It so shutter sound, priority is perfect for that. It sounds intimidating, but there's some muscle memory involved. So you'll get to know your camera and you'll get to know the appropriate shutter speed. You got this. Another negative side effect of using slow camera shutter speed shake. is camera shake. That always happens to me. I'm like yeah. shaky like a cold chihuahua. You're a very stable only from Shoot. years and years of practice. No, your your body doesn't move like mine, like even sitting here. Yeah. Yeah. Also, my heart doesn't beat. <laughs> you are a robot. This is the same deer as before at one thirtieth of a second, same shutter speed. But in this one, it's showing camera shake <laughs> um, because maybe there were just shaky hands. But I like it. The difference is the background is moving and the subject itself is moving. <laughs> this is that motion blur picture. You can see the difference. And that's important to know when you look at your own pictures and you're figuring out what went wrong. I don't know why it makes me laugh. If it's camera shake, you might be able to solve the problem with image stabilization or a tripod or a monopod or better hand holding techniques. Motion blur, we, all you could, the only way to fix that is to stop the subject from moving. moving you can, and you the can use a stuffed stop. deer instead. Yes. Get creative if you can't understand shutter speed. But you can solve them both by using a higher shutter speed. Yeah. Of course. But yeah, camera shake can be solved with a tripod. Generally, the heavier tripod, the better. Yeah, especially with night photography, if a wind kicks up, you don't want to be, have your, your tripod blowing around. There are caveats to that. If you're, say, on a pier, like a floating dock, yeah, that's going to move, even though it seems solid. Oh, or even just a wood deck. Yeah, if you're people on a boardwalk. walking around you, you, sometimes you might think, why is this shaky? What's going on? I've had people walk near my tripod on an unstable surface or a wind blow or vibrations. If there's if there are vibrations on the surface, there could be an engine running nearby. You start to pick up on all the movements in the world when you're trying to take a, a long shot like that. Yeah, I won't. I can't take macro photography on the second floor of our house. Because I just discovered with using like close up shots and a high megapixel, 50 megapixel sensor, the shakiness of somebody walking in another room is enough to move it just a little bit. So I need to be like on the, the ground floor or the basement. That's crazy. It makes that big of a difference. And yet I see people using a tripod on the deck of a boat sometimes. That's not going to help. <laughs> no, boats are moving too much. You're better off just trying to handhold it. <laughs> the deck of a boat. Seriously, <laughs> set up their whole tripod. I just imagine you pulling like a Nelson from The Simpsons and being like, ha ha, <laughs> you're dumb at tripods. Okay, image stabilization. This one helps the shaky folks like me quite a lot, especially yeah. now because they're, they're doing in-camera image stabilization. And that's a beautiful thing. Yeah, sensor stabilization works with any type of lens. Most lenses have it built in. And... I have a really hard time using a lens that's not stabilized. We've been spoiled by right. the technologies. So use something like the Canon 24-70 to f2.8, which is incredibly sharp, 
but it, it lacks image stabilization. And when you get it right or you're using a tripod, it, it'll be so sharp, but then you miss so many shots because even if you are, you're at 1 60th of a second or 1 1 25th of a second, you'll still see a little bit of camera shake in like every shot, it seems like. Yeah. Image stabilization can just be so helpful and so important. I know, and I know that it's going to tick off the purists that we love image stabilization, but sorry. Sorry. And of course, you can always just use a higher shutter speed. Right. But that in itself comes with negative side effects. There's a cost. Right. And the consequence is high noise the graininess that you see in your image. And if you try to use a really fast shutter speed all the time, noise will wreck your picture. Aside from not being artistic, you're going to get a lot of noise. Yeah. Look I, at this. Sometimes I'll forget and I'll leave the camera at a high shutter speed yeah. and then I'll go and I'll shoot a slow, slow moving subject like this chickadee. And I could have shot this at 1 1 25th probably, but I accidentally shot it at 1 8,000 and look at the noise. <laughs> the camera had to shoot at ISO 12,800. You really overestimated that chickadee. Yeah, he was not moving nearly that fast. <laughs> if you use a high shutter speed, the camera will have to use a higher ISO and that introduces a lot of ugly noise into your picture. So you're always trying to use the lowest shutter speed you can so you can get your camera at that base ISO, which is usually ISO 100 or ISO 200, depends on the camera to get nice clean images so how do you know chelsea what shutter speed you should use well you know we're talking about some new technology like image stabilization so this isn't going to be exactly accurate but the reciprocal rule is helpful and that's one over your focal length so if you're using a 500 millimeter lens you'll want your shutter speed to at least be one five hundredth of a second here are some examples at 100 millimeter lens one one hundredth 50 millimeter lens, 1 50th, 25 millimeter lens, Chelsea, what could it possibly be? 1 25th. And I will say also it depends on the individual because, and image stabilization, because you can shoot at 100 millimeters with probably like 1 80th. I don't know, you're pretty good. And I would need that 1 hundredth of a second or faster. Uh, I wanted to address the reciprocal rule because everybody knows about it, but really there have been so many advancements in recent years that the reciprocal rule seems out the window. Like I can't take sharp shots at sharp hundred millimeter shots at one one hundredth with our five DSR because it's too high of a megapixel. Yeah. Because of the high megapixels, I know I need to use a faster shutter speed. Other things that influence that will change the reciprocal rule are the crop factor yeah, the of crop your factor. camera. If you, have, you need to factor that into the reciprocal rule. If you're going to be making a large print, any little bits of camera shake are going to be that much more apparent in a big print. So you would need to factor in your final use of it. And if you have a really sharp lens, that will, a, a unsharp lens would, the blurriness would hide little bits of, of motion blur and camera shake whereas a sharp lens will really draw your eye to that flaw. So the reciprocal rule doesn't, it's, it's kind of impossible to follow in the modern it's, digital it's era. It's approximate. Right, it's a good starting point. It's a point. good starting point. But yeah. you can still wreck your shots with the reciprocal rule, or you can break it sometimes by five, six stops. You break it like I've never seen. Here's how I do it. I use the rule of doubles. I start out with the reciprocal rule, one over the <laughs> focal length, and I take one picture. And then I double that. I go from one one hundredth of a second to one fiftieth of a second, and then I take two shots, and then I double that. I go to one twenty fifth of a second, and I take four pictures, and then I'll double it again. One twelfth, eight pictures. Hey, you're scientific. On and on until I get bored, and then when I import my pictures, I go back to Lightroom, and I start with the slowest pictures because I know those will have the lowest ISO and the, they'll be the cleanest, and I find the first picture that's sharp. So I don't have to sort through all the pictures. I just start at the end and I pick the sharpest one. And sometimes I have to go all the way back to the one that I actually took at the reciprocal rule. But usually I find at least one picture that's sharp at a slower shutter speed. I know I did better, got a cleaner image at a lower ISO than I would have otherwise. So just as an example, at 50 millimeters, you might take one picture at 1 50th, two at 1 25th, and then four at 1 12th. And then just keep going until you run out of patience. I just worked the other way. Yeah, but there are diminishing returns. As you get slower, you get, use slower and slower shutter speeds, some pictures are going to turn out, but most of them won't. But you just need to get one. I also want to give another tip for reducing camera shake, and that's don't 
jab your finger on the shutter because just pushing the shutter will cause your camera to twist. And that twisting is something that image stabilization in the lens, at least can't fix. It can't counteract a twisting motion. So roll your finger on the shutter and roll it off. I'm going to demonstrate. <laughs> but also take at least three pictures and use continuous shutter. So you just roll it on, click, 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 and then roll it off. And that second picture, that middle picture will be sharper than the first or the last picture. Because you will shake the or twist the camera just a little bit when you press and release it. So those middle pictures are bound to be sharper. To demonstrate that, this yeah. picture was taken at 700 millimeters and then cropped to more like 1500 millimeters. One twentieth of a second handheld. You amaze me. I took a lot of pictures. I took more than a hundred pictures to get this. This is the teeny little hummingbird. Like it would easily fit in the palm of your hand. Yeah. But you can do that. And if you look at the picture, you'll see it's nice, nice and clean. Now there is a little bit of motion blur in its wings here. And you'll find that when you're shooting birds, the branches of trees move. That's what actually limits me. I could have gone to one tenth, except trees move very slowly. I've noticed that you have to consider if it's a windy day, even if your bird is perched, it might be moving just because of the wind and the branch moving. Freezing action. Yeah, these are reasons you might want to use a high shutter speed. There's that moon again that you took at one thirtieth of a second. Right. At one one twenty fifth, oh, yeah. you can see it's it's nice and sharp, but it meant that I had to shoot at a high ISO, ISO 3200. And that introduced more noise in the picture. So the picture's not as clean, but at least that moon isn't blurry like it was at 30, 30 seconds. seconds. Yeah. One fifteen hundredths of a second was enough to, to freeze the motion of all those seagulls. If I'd gone slower, it might've been okay, but they would have been blurry. It would have shown that motion. Maybe it would have even been better, but that's the choice I made at the time. You would have missed the moment potentially. Yeah. I didn't, I couldn't make them do it over and over again. They were only there for a split second. We and that's no the choice I made. <laughs> Here's a sports picture at even faster shutter speed, one sixteen hundredth of a second. And shooting this volleyball match, I did the experimentation thing. I started out at slower shutter speeds, but I wasn't getting any shots that were fast. I was finally happy with the motion at one sixteen hundredth of a second. This Osprey pulling a fish out of the water, you can see one two thousandths of a second is enough to mostly freeze the bird. You can see the wingtips still blurred a little bit, but the water droplets are frozen. The fish mostly is frozen. So only the fastest moving parts of the bird show any motion. And at one four thousandths of a second, even with a flash, it wasn't quite enough to freeze all the water droplets here. There's yeah. still a little bit of motion, but for the most part, it does convey as freezing the action. So again, you just have to experiment, take some pictures, review them, decide if you're happy with the amount of motion shown and adjust your shutter speed, but give yourself the opportunity to review your pictures. Yeah. And learn your gear and learn yourself. Learn if you are more stable than the reciprocal rule or what you need to do to get the shot that you want. Yeah. And the image stabilization of your camera and or lens, mm -hmm. it can vary a lot. Some some lenses are only good for a couple of stops. Some are good for four stops, sometimes more. Another potentially negative side effect of using fast shutter speeds is flash sync problems. So every camera has a sync speed and usually it's one two hundredth or one two fiftieth of a second. Yeah. And if you put a flash that was designed to work with your camera, it'll talk back and forth and they'll probably stop you from choosing a faster shutter speed. But if you're using like studio lights that might not be able to talk natively to your camera, You'll see flash sync problems like this, where the flash, you can see the flash didn't fire evenly. So at one eight thousandths of a second, the camera was, the, the shutter actually becomes a narrow opening, a little slit that moves from basically the top of the frame or the bottom of the frame to the top of the frame. Yeah. And when the flash fired, that slit was moving like right past your chin here, which is why everything below it is black. But then the flash fired really bright and then just kind of gradually faded out, which is why the top of the frame here gets darker and darker. It's just a flash sync problem. And the only way to solve that is to use a slower shutter speed or get strobes that support high speed sync. Some general guidelines for what yeah. shutter speed you should start with. Okay. So portraits, one thirtieth of a second to one two fiftieth of a second. People aren't going to be moving that much 
Unless they're baby, maybe babies. Yeah, you get but a fast baby. At one thirtieth of a second, you'll get some pictures where people are their face is a little bit blurry because they're yeah. twisting their head a little bit. One two fiftieth will stop most people who are posing, but will force you to use a higher ISO, adding more noise. Still animals. If you're Tony Northrup, maybe one twentieth of a second. <laughs> Or one two fiftieth of a second, maybe get a perched animal or something frozen, a fox or a deer. Yeah, but again, offset it by taking lots of pictures. Flying birds depends what they're doing. If they're soaring, that's going to be different than them diving. Depends on the bird. Uh, but one one thousandth to one two thousandth of a second should freeze the motion. Yeah, if it's a vulture and they're just soaring, one one thousandth seems to work well. But like you try to get a songbird that's uh, flying, yeah, it's hard just to get it in the frame. But then you might even need to be at one four thousandths or higher. Kid sports, one one twenty fifth to one two fiftieth of a second. You want to show a little bit of motion. You don't want people going to kick a ball and then they're just frozen. It's good to see a little movement. Yeah, like you want their foot moving as mm -hmm. they kick the ball, but yeah. you don't want their whole body to be blurry. Yeah. But as people get older, even in like high school and middle school, they start to move faster. And you have to kind of compensate for that with your shutter speed. So I tend to start at a higher shutter speed. Just a, f a funny way to put it. The humans tend to get faster. I've noticed this about humans. Oh, good job, Tony Bot. <laughs> One of the few reasons people shoot multiple minute exposures is for star trails, which actually show the, the motion of the stars as the earth rotates. and just to give you a point of reference, this is a shot I took at three minutes. You can see they're moving around the North Star, and the stars are not points, but rather they're little bitty lines. And that's what you'll get at about three minutes. If you go to 20 minutes or so, those lines just continue to get longer and longer and longer. Mm -hmm. And usually with star trails, the longer the better. If you can stand to run your camera for two hours, then the lines will be all that much more striking. Check our video. We have a video on that too. Look at us. Once again, go to stp.io to slash tutorial to actually learn how to dial the settings into your individual camera. And thank you to The Great Courses Plus for sponsoring this episode, for making it all possible. They have great educational video content. They have over 7,000 video lectures. And they have professors keep and busy. professionals, Nath National Geographic photographers. So check it out. You can get a month free trial at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Tony. They're wonderful. Thank you. Thanks for watching. If you have follow-up questions or something you want to add, add a comment down below. Give us a like if you found it helpful. And of course, subscribe to see more free content from our channel. Thank you. More free content. Mm.